Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Yes, my name is uh, Sean Braithwaite. I'm originally from Montreal in Canada, but actually for the past five years, I've been living in Berlin. Um, so it's super nice to uh, do a presentation here and get to know a little bit of the scene happening. Uh, for the past eight years or so, I've been working with data in different capacities from like the infrastructure perspective of maintaining databases to doing more distributed systems, Cassandra type work and most recently as a data scientist, sort of producing, I guess, models of how consumers listen to music. Um, these different experiences have really informed the way I think about data and the stuff that we build, uh, and I've tried to synthesize some of those learnings into this presentation. So the name of this talk is uh, The Mechanics of Data Pipeline, and it's effectively for people who have been working with data and don't want to babysit ETLs. So first, uh, a little bit of context. I work at a company called SoundCloud, and SoundCloud is this you know, uh, music streaming platform similar to Spotify, but distinctively different. Um, we have hundreds of millions of people you know, all around the world uh, consuming music, but you know, it sort of has gone through this tremendous phase of growth. Uh, when I started, we were maybe 75 people or something, and are now, I think, 400. Um, we were initially using you know, Google Analytics, like I think most web properties, and then inevitably started to build more things in-house. Um, so during this transition, the, the, the role of, of data also changed, that we started you know, doing machine learning, we had to fix problems like spam, and we also started taking it more seriously and allowing it to sort of drive our decisions. So the context here you know, that is framing some of these recommendations and these thoughts about um, architecture are uh, you know, a diverse organization where different, different domain experts are trying to collaborate with data to do something quite complex, uh, which is understand consumers. So what are we talking about specifically? Well, data pipelines uh, are the software, or Data pipelines are the software structures which emerge to process and disseminate information. But let's maybe break that down a little bit. Um, so data pipelines are distributed systems, so we need to talk about the ways in which they are distributed uh, and what structures they form when we put them together. And I say here I use the word emerge uh, for a particular reason. I would like to suggest that data pipelines are not something that could be designed up front but are somehow structured and grow. And we want to talk about in this presentation how to sort of shape that growth. So here's an idealistic view of, uh, of what one of these software structures looks like. Um, you have a single source, so data coming from SoundCloud, and then being disseminated to multiple stages. Um, each block uh, is a stage and is owned by a particular team. Uh, these teams uh, vary, or these stages, they, they, they vary in terms of runtime, the technology they use, and the storage uh, of where they put the data based on sort of like distinct requirements of the domain uh, of the team that owns them. So uh, each of these teams has diverse domain expertise, which they use to, trans to enrich the data in, uh, in some kind of meaningful uh, way. Each stage can consume from one or more previous stages and also provide data to uh, multiple subsequent stages. So why do we build these things? Well, because problem domains like music, like platforms with hundreds of millions of people are really complex. Uh, to face these challenges, we might split it up into multiple subdomains, each with distinct sets of experts. Uh, one way to think about data pipelines is as the software structure which enables experts from different domains to collaborate. So how do we build them? You know, sometimes not so well. Uh, these software structures have a tendency to become quite complex. Uh, as they become more complex, they take more time to manage, and they turn people with expertise or people with PhDs uh, into babysitters or into operations people. Um, in the worst case, they become impossible to extend. Um, there are several reasons why these, these data pipelines become quite complex. 
And they could be, you know, perhaps we don't understand the domain that we're trying to model. So say if we're trying to solve spam, we may not have the right expertise in spam just yet. Uh, we might misunderstand the nature of the integration. So how do we tie these together? We might do it in an ad hoc way, uh, which sort of proliferates complexity. And we might misunderstand coordination. We might not have a good idea of what are the times in which people need to collaborate and what are the times of which we want to automate that collaboration. So given all this, I hope by the end of my talk, I will have convinced you of three things. First, that data pipelines emerge and need to be designed foundationally different than static software. Second, that they are shaped by the organization and domains which produce them. Uh, and lastly, that what prevents data pipelines from growing are these cases of incidental coordination. So, to understand the architecture of data pipelines, I think we need to map the conditions which produce them. Um, they say that people are the products of their environments, uh, but I also think this applies to software. So Conway's law states that uh, the software we build is somehow a reflection of the communication boundaries of the organizations which produce it. Uh, in general, you know, I think this is, this is true, but perhaps doesn't go far enough. Um, I, would, I would argue that the way these boundaries form uh, matter as well. To make this argument, I think we need to talk at this higher level of abstraction. From this level, I think we could get a better view of the forces shaping data pipelines and make better decisions about design. So these things can start quite small, um, typically with a single ETL. So say you have some kind of events being written to HDFS every time a user plays a track. So this is one of the fundamental things that SoundCloud as a platform does. So HDFS, I hope as we, we all know, is the Hadoop file system, which is really great at storing petabyte scale data sets. Uh, it isn't so good, however, at querying data. To make the data easier to query, you might want to load this into a database. Um, this way you can figure out, for instance, how many plays you got yesterday and compare that to uh, how many plays you got this day last year or something like this. Um, this is a perfect case for an ETL, but what is it actually doing? Um, well, it's creating this sort of split. Uh, plays, as a concept, now exists in two places, in HDFS and also in this queryable database. But the split uh, occurs on different levels, so on the level of the storage system, on the level of bounded contexts, and also on the level of, of organizations and teams. Um, understanding these splits is important as it drives the evolution of the data pipeline and ends up shaping it. So bounded context is this idea developed from uh, domain-driven design. How many people are somewhat familiar with domain-driven design? I think a large amount. That's nice, but let's actually define our terms here. So. Specifically, it refers to uh, groups of people or possibly software which use a consistent language to describe domain objects. So in this case, play. Uh, as a music platform, uh, SoundCloud records data and plays in particular. Uh, we use this data for all sorts of things, actually, to train machine learning models, to make recommendations of what people should listen to next, but also to perform complex calculations uh, to pay out artists royalties based on uh, how much they're engaging the platform. Um, but before we do either of these cases, um, we do this attempt to, to filter out spam. So now imagine we have two separate teams. Uh, one, which is sort of uh, an expert in fighting spam, we call them trust and safety. And then another, which is producing reports uh, we'll call that team uh, royalties and reporting. The data that the spam uh, the fighters work with is completely different than the data we use to produce the reports. But they use the same domain uh, object, right, plays. It just means different things. So one is subject to spam and might have additional fields, and the other is not. So if you were to say, take a, a list of the top 10 countries that get plays, the data set that has spam would look very different than the data set without. Uh, 
Um, so the, this filtering of spam represents a split in the bounding context in which the play takes on these, these two different meanings. So having events like plays in HDFS is a great first step. Um, I could always write a MapReduce job and figure out how many plays I got each day. That's easy. Uh, but what if I want to build a web application to show these play counts to users? Say I want to embed it in every single widget uh, on every single platform that SoundCloud is available. Well, in this case, you know, HDFS is not a suitable option. So differences in access patterns drive the introduction of these new storage mechanisms. So HDFS, relational databases, column restores, key value stores are all good at different things. Um, as use cases evolve, we often need to introduce new kinds of databases, and the data pipeline is then used to connect these together. So teams grow to the size that they could somehow manage to communicate and collaborate efficiently. Uh, there are at least two reasons why teams split. Uh, first, when teams get so large that they naturally partition into groups that work more closely together than they do with, uh, with, with the rest of the team. Um, and the second is when a problem domain becomes so complex that uh, the team naturally needs to split to have a coherent image of, of what they were doing. You know, one case of this would be when most startups begin, everyone could sit at the same table and, you know, there's just like the engineering team. And then eventually maybe someone is more working on data or someone's more working on front end and they decide that they need to form separate teams and we need to uh, sort of facilitate communication between them. So sometimes that these uh, splits are also represented by uh, differences in bounded context. And the reason for that is because sometimes these splits are actually uh, nested. Um, they are hierarchical in a way. Teams contain one or many bounded contexts, which are represented on one or many different storage systems. You know, transgressions of this hierarchy incur a high cost of coordination. So for instance, if I were to share a database with a different team and I wanted to change, uh, maybe add a column, remove a column, or even just change the semantics of a column, I could wreak havoc on every query that was somehow dependent on that schema. So this is this case of uh, incidental coordination, and it's what we're trying to avoid. So let's look at uh, reasonable ways that we could aim to cross these boundaries of storage systems, teams, and bounded contexts. So these splits that were sort of outlined are important, uh, but they need to be crossed to enable collaboration. So these splits are what is connected by the data pipeline, and they require somehow a mapping on each level of the split. The goal of designing uh, a, a, a data pipeline as sort of like an aggregate software structure, right, is really to capture all these interactions between the entities at the different levels. So in the case in which we are loading data from HDFS into a relational database, we must admit that these storage systems differ not only in how we use them, but how they work. So if you were here for Steve's talk that preceded this one, you get this really good example about how S3 might describe the operation, might have a similar API to a POSIX system, but actually what's happening underneath the hood is fundamentally different. Um, this idea of being able to get a consistent view of data is not available on every storage system. So when we build uh, an ETL, which is somehow connecting maybe a consistent storage system to an inconsistent storage system, we are mapping fundamentally the mechanics between, the, uh, the, between how these, these, these systems work. So if we follow this domain-driven design model, um, communication between bounded context is done with events. Uh, events are these immutable objects which represent state change. And working with events really structures the way we think about state. By sharing different uh, events, different bounded contexts are able to construct distinct views of the data which are defined by their own internal logic. In this way, state is something which is computed instead of shared. In the case of spam and plays, a team with domain expertise in filtering spam would provide a record for every play event augmented with uh, a classification 
and possibly a confidence rating. People consuming that data set would then both have, you know, know what is spam and what is not, but be able to modulate their tolerance for spam based on their particular use case. So if all you're trying to do is display some counts to a bunch of users, then you might have a, higher to a high tolerance for spam uh, in exchange for timeliness. Um, but if you are paying money based on usage, you might have a very low tolerance for spam, and you might accept that things are going to take longer to process if it gives you uh, more confidence in the classification. So back, coming back to this case of, uh, of spam and royalties, what happens um, when you see a spike of plays on a single day? You know, is it because uh, we were subject to a new kind of spam attack, which we are unfamiliar with and were unable to mitigate? Or did Kanye West release a track? You know, this, is one of, this is a clear violation of the intended isolation provided by bound on contacts. And the result is this case of incidental coordination, where, case, where teams you know, have to get together and reconcile their view of the data and sort of come up with a new definition of what is right and wrong before they split again and become independent or continue to operate independently. So how do we form these contracts between stages in a data pipeline, actually? So if every team uh, involved needs the same thing, then it's quite simple. For example, data recorded yesterday will be available the following morning on HDFS. Uh, but that doesn't work because not everyone needs, needs the same storage system. And also, as an international company, there's no unified concept of, of, of morning or one person's concept of morning might certainly not work uh, for someone else. So these contracts between stages also in some way need to be compatible as ETLs become composed, sort of the transitive nature of the interaction means that if I produce data at 2 a.m., the soonest that I can make data available would be at 2.01, given some job takes one minute to, to process. Uh, if we do not build these coordination facilities into our software, we'll have to coordinate at this much slower rate, you know, as people. Um, these are these cases of, of incidental coordination that we're trying to avoid. Uh, and we're trying to design around in our sort of conception of data pipelines. Oops. Events as the sole communication method which can go between bounded contexts are owned by a single team. I mean, they alone can change the definition of that data, but it has to be somehow coordinated with, uh, with consumers. So when a team decides to change their definition, how are these changes propagated throughout the pipeline is really the question. Uh, are there mechanisms for embedding these expectations in contracts? And what recourse do dependencies have when these contracts are violated? Either we provide a formal mechanism to evolve definitions, or again, we incur this cost of incidental coordination. So individual ETLs can also be difficult to operate when they try to model an unbounded amount of data. You know, a single bad record could stall uh, a pipeline. But the question is, should it? You know, how many bad records would make the result unusable? This is only a question that we could answer through coordination between uh, producer and consumer. But once agreed upon, you know, it's the job of the software we build to enforce these contracts and to provide mechanisms for remediation. When a job does fail, you know, the question is then, who is responsible uh, and what recourse do they have? In the case of manual intervention, should every downstream consumer uh, be called upon when something upstream goes wrong? I don't think so. Instead, we need to automate this process and provide a mechanism which not only responds to failure, but provides a method of failure resolution. Uh, when a fix is applied to an upstream job, the pipeline should be able to continue to run automatically. Okay, so the setting that we've used so far has been uh, quite abstract. You know, the purpose was to map out the conditions which shape the software we build. In this mapping, in mapping this out, we were able to outline what's hard about working with data pipelines, specifically designing systems which are expanding in terms of technology, domain, and people simultaneously. Uh, 
And it's with this context that we can set upon the task of providing concrete recommendations. First, we'll lay out the anatomy of an ETL just to define our terms. And then we'll, decide, we'll describe some, some sane ways of, of gluing it all together. Uh, this glue will serve as a protocol which specifies how and when we read and write data to minimize this risk of incidental coordination. So uh, a single ETL is pretty straightforward. Um, it has a source, some kind of computation or job. I'll kind of use this job or stage word interchangeably, and then some kind of destination. Uh, the source and destination are storage systems. Uh, they could vary, so one could be a database and one could be HDFS. The ETL here can also be seen as a job which executes with some regularity. Um, in a streaming world, this would mean when a batch reaches a certain size, and in a batch world, this would mean based on some schedule. But each ETL uh, represents not only computation, but effectively uh, a domain model. So when we filter spam plays, we are expressing a, a model which attempts to capture you know, what is and is not spam. This model then produces a new representation of the input set augmented with this internal logic. Within this transformation is also a domain-specific notion of correctness, and sometimes this can be difficult to share. So how do we know when a job has succeeded, actually? Um, with big data, the computations we design have to account for this uh, enormous amount of variety. With this variety become, comes the risk of partial failure. A job may complete in terms of process completion, but the output might not reflect our expectations. So think about a job completing, but producing maybe 10 kilobytes instead of the typical three gigabytes. So in this case of, of spam, you know, a machine learning model tasks uh, which has no ground truth. There is very little objective uh, measure of what is and is not spam. And the result of this it means you know, deploying changes is actually quite terrifying. On one hand, we might be protecting users from nefarious agents. On the other hand, we might be uh, penalizing legitimate engagement. So this ambiguous notion of correctness has the effect of making us as software uh, developers reluctant to change. Even if we suspect improvements can be made, we need to ensure that our changes are objectively better. From a job perspective, we can produce this fingerprint. So this is a new term that I'm introducing. And sometime, somehow it tries to capture a, a collection of summary statistics which model the underlying domain. Uh, these statistics should aim to capture both the variance and the invariance in the data set. So for instance, the, sp the amount of spam that's produced each day uh, might not be constant. You might have you know, good days and bad days. But what if we could produce you know, a summary statistic which is invariant? What if we look at, for instance, the distribution of IP addresses by country or the amount of user agents? We can capture uh, this notion of variance using this measure of entropy, which is somehow uh, the amount of chaos or structure in a, in a signal. In either case, uh, we need this notion of correctness. Uh, it's important that definitions be bound to the right domain. Using the operational domain, so like the exit code or the status or what Hadoop gives you back, you know, is really insufficient for coordinating correctness between producers and consumers. Instead, you know, correctness should be modeled in the business domain and reflect the knowledge of domain experts, even as this knowledge changes. A notion of correctness captured by outputting summary statistics is essential for co collaboration. As ETLs are composed, fingerprints can be consumed by downstream jobs to assert their own notion of correctness, making the nature of that collaboration much richer. So when we compose ETLs, we allow this collaboration between additional domains. The example we've used so far has been mostly about spam and licensing, but as a larger business, of course, you have many domains. Communication between stages is done with these sets of immutable events, which flow through the pipeline as each stage uh, augments them with some domain expertise. Uh, 
you know, by chaining ETLs together, we are also creating this operational dependency. So problems at you know, one stage of the pipeline have a direct impact downstream. The, the transitive nature of these dependency means that it's often not clear who is responsible. And, who should, and more importantly, who should be involved in, uh, in fixing it. Um, if we don't design our pipelines correctly, fixing broken jobs um, can require tedious and expensive intervention by teams. You know, these cases of incidental coordination have many side effects, but I think one of them is, is particularly worth calling out, uh, and that's, you know, erosion of trust. If the, if the same job keeps breaking, despite the best efforts uh, of the person who owns it or the team who owns it, you know, those downstream consumers can become increasingly frustrated. Uh, these frustrations can often lead people to effectively design around failing jobs, creating more uh, solutions which are dramatically more complex than, than need be. You know. This case of erosion of trust and designing around failure is something we really need to avoid. Um, Instead, we want to design for failure in an explicit way. So, change which happens at, at one stage of the pipeline has direct impact downstream. We know this now. But what we want is a way to respond to this change in an explicit and automated way. To do this, what we need is a dependency structure. But this dependency structure exists at two distinct levels. So first, we try and capture the dependency between jobs. I think that's the easy part. But the second uh, captures dependency between data. So dependencies between jobs can really be handled by a typical scheduling system like Airflow or Luigi. Um, these systems ensure that different stages of a pipeline can easily be chained together. These systems allow us to parameterize execution and specify things like you know, the input uh, folder on HDFS versus the output folder. And in this way, they have like a, a rough understanding of the, the dependency uh, between data. But maybe we need to be a little bit more explicit than that. And actually, we had a very nice talk last week by um, Michael Hauser from ResearchGate presenting Memento, which actually solves this problem. Um, I would advise all of you to check out the slides when they're released. Uh, but what about the case in which change doesn't follow a traditional schedule? So what happens when data arrives late? Uh, or a report has already been generated, and then we realize that it was missing some data. Um, does it become the case first of recognizing late arrival, and then contacting every team of every stage uh, of the pipeline to rerun their jobs? You know, I, I hope not. <laughs> Instead, pipelines should be able to use this dependency structure to run automatically. I'm introducing this term here, convergence, as it captures the idea that data is the conclusion of some process. This process should be indifferent to the number of steps it takes, actually. It should simply converge. Convergence, you know, it ensures that our jobs update automatically when change happens upstream. It requires these explicit links between jobs and the data they generate with the benefit of limiting manual intervention. But some kinds of intervention uh, cannot be avoided, in particular when our notion of correctness changes. So when working with data, oftentimes our notion of correctness is mutable. Um, updates to the domain model need to be reflected in the data which represents them. Um, in the case of spam, you know, definitions of spam, what is and is not spam, are changing all the time as we get exposed to new kinds of attack uh, and just continue to learn. But when our definition of spam changes, it means that data we might have been certain about in the past can no longer be trusted and we re need to redo old computations. So data pipelines which can redo computations are called retroactive. Uh, this property allows domain experts to effectively change their mind. Uh, when they do, we can then ensure that these changes are materialized in the data. Um, I know this might sound extreme, but I would say that data pipelines which don't have this property cannot really be trusted. There would always be this risk that the data these pipelines provide is a reflection of bad assumptions. Uh, 
Um, on the contrary, you know, data pipelines which are retroactive uh, can be trusted as they can actually represent, you know, the best of our knowledge. You know, advocating for mutation, especially in sort of this highly distributed um, world that we're in, uh, can seem quite scary. Uh, but maybe it doesn't have to be. We know that we have to change the data to reflect changes in our domain model, but it's not always obvious uh, how to do this with big data systems. Given that our data pipeline spans multiple storage services, there's no guarantee that we can simply update records like we can in a database. Instead, I would advocate for thinking about data pipelines as immutable data structures. Um, immutable data structures never override data, but instead produce multiple versions. Um, these versions of data can actually be tied to the software which produced them. Um, since each version of the data comes with a fingerprint summarized in the data, it contains or we can quickly measure if we've actually made improvements. So say our fingerprint includes like our classification rate, and then we could make updates to the software to bring that into what we consider to be a reasonable bounds. As an individual owning a single job, these facilities provide me with a way to be confident in making changes. Uh, without the risk of overriding data or inciting a case of incidental coordination, you know, I could deploy my changes automatically. Uh, in combination with output fingerprints, I could put my software in a continuous delivery pipeline. And every time I make a change to the code, I could actually make a change to the data. In this way, data pipelines as distributed uh, software structures can start utilizing a lot of the development that's been happening in other fields, and particularly in uh, microservices. So taking a step back, these properties I've defined are not simply about individual jobs. Instead, they describe uh, primarily the interaction between jobs, and in combination, hopefully, the aggregate behavior of the system. Um, making an individual stage item potent or capable of scheduling itself when the underlying data changes, uh, it, it's very useful. It, it's something I would certainly advocate that you do. However, I'm not sure that goes far enough. Um, expectations of operational behavior shouldn't vary throughout the pipeline. Uh, this will create these preferences of what, people, uh, what data people are comfortable depending on. Instead, these properties that I outline are objectives for a collective common protocol for collaborating with data. OK. So in this talk, uh, I tried to present data pipelines in, in, a, in a new way. I took a step back and defined them not as incidental Frankenstein compositions of software, but as structures. Uh, these structures emerge for a good reason, to connect and distribute domain expertise. We looked at the specific forces governing the evolution of data pipelines over three levels, storage systems, bounded context, and teams. This evolution came with a need to map between separate entities, an act which came with uh, a consequence, right? Coordination. We then tried to make the distinction between incidental coordination and the mechanisms we could build into our software to avoid them. Avoiding incidental coordination came from three suggestions making dependency structures of jobs and data explicit, ensuring the output of jobs never overrides data, but simply provides a newer version, and finally, by baking, the, baking in the assumption that calculations we perform on data are going to be wrong, and that we most certainly need the facilities to make them right. So finally, you know, data pipelines connect and enable collaboration between diverse perspectives. Their growth is a reflection of our need to form a richer view of the world, and we most certainly need to build them better. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Thanks very much. I, I thought that was an extremely insightful and interesting talk. Um, I have a question if you could maybe say a few words about two domains that are connected not by an ETL type pipeline, but simply by data replication, and which of your thoughts are similar or different on that kind of system? Data replication. So I are imagine you maybe your ingestion and, yeah. and uh, the spam detection might actually share data that aren't transformed in any way. 
Well, I think the ingestion phase, right, which is somehow summarized in a single block in the diagram, of course, that's actually multiple stages. So one of these things would be uh, encoding. So we take data that might arrive from JSON as sort of the, the lowest common denominator of formats between different clients, and then we might encode it as a protobuf uh, at ingestion. Another thing that we do at the ingestion stage is um, account for some notion of deduplication. Uh, that happens from op for operational reasons instead of semantic reasons. So the, a lot of the tools we use, like Kafka, you know, they, they get their delivery guarantees through retries. So we try and account for that at the ingestion phase and isolate um, sort of different domain expertise from these operational complexities. Um, does that sort of capture the replication question? Yeah, please. Any other questions? I really like the fingerprinting idea, mm. and it sounded, um, I really understood how you can use it for your everyday um, traffic, let's say, but uh, you mentioned that um, you have to differentiate between uh, Kanye West releasing a new track, or is it a spam attack? So I yeah. really imagine that the stats there would change. Yeah. So how do you know what to do? So this is this case of incidental coordination. And actually sitting in front of you is someone uh, working with us on this very problem. So maybe you could catch up with her afterwards. Um, but truly, every SoundCloud is a really interesting problem domain because of this variance of signal. Yeah. Right? It's incredible the things that you could arrive. Like we have to remind ourselves every year of Ramadan um, to understand, even from an operational perspective, we see the, the world change. Um, I think when, when someone releases a, a big uh, a track, like some years ago, uh, well, Miles Mill had, a, had a, some kind of battle with, uh, with Drake or whatever, and I think our ingestion infrastructure uh, s like scaled by an order of magnitude or something like that. Uh, and in this case, you know, it really is... Um, Everyone getting paged, jumping on a channel, and speculation. You know, there's very labor-intensive costs because people are not doing their regular work, but actually debugging. And I guess the, the frustrating part with these cases of incident coordination is you don't know if you're doing the right thing, actually. Like, should I be looking? Is it, is it you? Like, is it, is it this person? Um, but the, the reality, it, it, it happens, and I, and I hope in, the, in this talk, um, I didn't really present mechanism, I didn't pr provide any uh, recommendation on how to detect it, but instead how to remediate it. Um, that once you, if you say that it's a spam attack, you know that data is going to have to be reprocessed, and uh, that part you can automate. But figuring out as a company, you know, that you might be under attack from a state actor or whatever, it's really expensive, it's all hands on deck, and uh, it's, it's an amazing process to go through, actually. I agree. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker again.